Well, good morning, everyone. In the weeks that are leading up to Christmas, we're looking at why Jesus Christ came into the world. And we've seen that Jesus himself spoke very directly about this on several occasions. And this year, we're looking at the words of the Lord Jesus about why he came into the world as they're recorded in the Gospel of John. And last time, we saw that Jesus came to do the Father's will. And the will of the Father, very wonderfully, is that Jesus will save soul and body, nothing left behind, uh, all who will trust in, believe in Him. Today, we're coming to the second and perhaps the best known of the statements of the Lord Jesus Christ about why He came into the world. It's in John chapter 10 that has just been read for us in verse 10 there, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Then Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, many of us will spend time over Christmas with loved ones who once professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but do so no longer. And I want to suggest to you today that these words of Jesus may give you a way of engaging them, your loved ones who would no longer profess to believe or may be in difficulties with regards to faith, these words of Jesus may be a way in which you can engage them in conversation even over this Christmas period. And I want very practically to suggest today a question that you can ask, picture that you can paint and a promise that you can make. First then, a question that you can ask, and here we're looking at these words, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Now, notice that Jesus first tells us the thief comes to take what you had. The thief steals. A thief may do this, of course, by force, uh, breaking into a house, can do it by stealth or deception, stealing identity or whatever. But the point is that a thief always takes away what was yours and leaves you with less. Then Jesus says that the thief not only steals, but also kills and destroys. And perhaps it is even among us here this morning, and certainly it will be among some who we love, that once there was faith and hope and joy in your life, but the faith that once seemed to be burning very brightly is now either a flickering candle or perhaps seems to have gone out altogether. Hope has been crushed. There are folks in the congregation every Sunday morning whose experience is that I had believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, but it just seems like water has been poured on the fire of my faith and of my joy. And you find yourself saying, perhaps, something within me has died. And if that's where you are, I'm just so grateful that you are here this morning. It's exactly the right thing when you're struggling. Come and open yourself up to the word of the Lord Jesus Christ that you may find new strength, new hope, new faith, new joy even today. Now, we are living at a time when many people clearly are moving away from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, here's the question that I think is helpful to ask. Who stole what you had? Jesus says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So here's the question that you might ask, like to ask of a loved one. Who took what you had? Who destroyed it? See, there is always a story behind any person who moves away from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Always a story. And if you have enough trust in that relationship to be able to ask the person to tell you their story, you may open up a door to fruitful conversation. Here's the question. Who stole what you had? Now, the Apostle Paul once asked this question. You have it in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 7. 
He says there to some in this community in Galatia, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? So see what's happening here are a group of believers. They were growing in their faith. They seemed evidently to be serving the Lord. They were running well, but they were hindered. And notice that Paul does not say, what was it that hindered you? He says, who was it who hindered you? You had joy in serving Jesus. You were were, um, running well. And someone has hindered you. Now, who was it? That's the question. Who was it that got in the way of your faith? What was it that they said or did that stole your peace, killed your hope, destroyed your joy? This is a really important question. You may be able to help a person by asking it in the right way and at the right time. And notice, by the way, the tact with which the Apostle Paul asks this question. The the first thing he says is, you were running well. Then he asks the question, who hindered you? And you might be able to say to someone you love, you know, I remember a time when there was great joy in in you. I, I remember where it seemed that there was a brightly burning flame of faith in your life, and you did this, and you got involved in that, and uh, you were uh, engaged in this project, and you had these friends, and so forth and so on. There seemed to be a bright flame of faith burning in you. You were running well. But now here's the question. Something or someone has taken away what you had. Now, who was it? How did that happen? Was there one thief? Or were there many? You were running well. Who hindered you? Now, that's a question that we may ask of loved ones that are moving away or have moved away from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But here we are as a gathered congregation here this morning in the third service. And every week, there are some in our congregation who are just struggling because you feel like you're losing faith, you're losing hope, you're losing joy. And again, I'm so glad you're here. Do you see what is happening in your life? You've been robbed. You've been hindered. Thieves have shown up in your life and they've stolen what you had. You were running well. Now, here's the question. Who hindered you? Who stole what you had? Now, how is it that you deal with thieves? Because what Jesus is telling us here is you need to be awake to the fact that this is a world of thieves. There are many thieves at work in this world, and they take away joy and faith and peace from many people. How do you deal with thieves? Well, Jesus says in verse 8, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. And I would say to you in all candor that if it is the case that you have been robbed of faith or of hope or of love or of joy, it is very likely that somewhere along the line you have been listening to the voice of someone who actually was a thief. You didn't realize they were a thief. But the effect of your listening to their voice is that you've been robbed of something that you once had. Now, it may be that this is a friend, or a group of friends, or an author, or all series of books that you've been reading, and the effect is you've been robbed of faith, and of peace, and of the joy that you once had. It may be a teacher, it may even be a pastor who's no longer holding to the Bible and has wandered off on some other path, and you've lost under that person's influence the joy and the peace and the faith that you had before. It's been listening to the voice of a thief that has led to this loss in your life. And your recovery is going to begin when you stop listening to the thief and you start listening to another voice. And I'm here today to plead with you 
to listen afresh to the voice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the first thing he's saying to you from these verses of Scripture is you need to realize that you live in a world where there are many, many thieves. And the effect of thieves is that they take away what you have if you listen to what they say. So, recognize the thieves who steal and kill and destroy and stop listening to them. That's where recovery begins. Now, that's the first thing, a question that you can ask. Who stole what you had? It's a very important and a biblical question. Second, here's a picture that you can paint. The thief, Jesus says, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life. What wonderful words these are. Jesus says, I came that they may have life life. Now, try and settle this in your mind and in your heart. Jesus Christ is not a thief. He didn't come to take from you. He came to give to you. He certainly didn't come from heaven into this world in order to make your life or anyone else's life, life less. He came to make our lives much, much more. Now, let me then paint for you a picture that you might be able then to use with someone else who is moving away from faith, and it's a picture taken directly from the Bible. Picture your life as being like a house, and Jesus is on the outside, and He's knocking on the door. Now, of course, you realize, many of you, that that comes straight from the book of Revelation, chapter 3 and verse 20, where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, here's then the picture that you can paint. You're sitting in the living room of your house and there's a knock on the door. You're not expecting any visitors, and so you pull back the curtain, you have a little peek to see who is out there, and what you see will determine whether or not you will let this person who is knocking on the door in. You would never knowingly let a thief into your house. And if you fear that the person knocking on the door may in fact be a thief, if you fear that Jesus may take away your freedom to do what you want to do, that he'll somehow kill off what you enjoy, well, then there's going to be no way in the world that you will ever open the door to him. But if you were to see and believe that the person who is knocking on the door of your life is not a thief, but has come for an entirely different purpose, that He has come in order to give you life as you do not presently have it, well, then when He knocks on the door, you would have an entirely different response. You would pull back the bolt, and you would take off the chain, and you'd put your hand on the door handle, and you would open the door gladly and welcome Him in. So, I want you to hear these words of Jesus today. I came that they may have life. Now, I can understand that someone might respond to that by saying, well, I already have life. I have good life. Perfectly content. I have good friends. I'm happy. And I don't need Jesus. But here's the thing, God gives us life, but not one of us actually holds it in our own possession. Life can be taken from us in any number of ways. I mean, life can be taken by cancer, it can be taken by an accident, it can be taken by an act of violence. There are a thousand ways in which any of us could lose our life in any given day. But for Jesus, it is different. At the beginning of the gospel, John makes this remarkable statement, in him was life. Think about that. Life was actually in him. 
he holds it as his own possession. And later in John's Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 26, we have these remarkable words of Jesus where he says, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. This is an amazing statement. The Lord Jesus Christ has life in himself. Life is in him. No one can take it from him. And, and Jesus says that he is therefore able to give this life that is in himself to whoever he chooses. That's John chapter 5 and verse 21. Now, this is a little hard to get hold of, so let, let me try and give it to you in a picture by way of illustration. And this picture is right out of the Bible. One of the best known stories in the Old Testament is the story of how God made himself known to Moses through a burning bush. And you may remember in Exodus in chapter 3, we're told that God appeared to Moses in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush, that the bush was burning and yet it was not consumed. So here are these flames, here's this fire, and it's in the bush, but it does not derive its life from the bush, it, the flame is burning, and yet the bush is not consumed. Now think about that with me for a moment. It's an extraordinary picture. Because we all know that a fire burns as long as there is fuel. You sit around the campfire in summer in an evening, and you put wood on the fire, and as long as you keep adding more wood, the fire keeps uh, on burning, but the fire does not have life in itself. It depends on the wood for fuel. And when the wood is consumed, well, very simply, the fire dies down and eventually it will go out. But you see, what Moses saw was a fire that had life in itself. The bush burned and yet it wasn't consumed. The fire had its own life. It did not depend on the bush for fuel. And, and God is revealing himself to Moses in this way. Moses, this is what I am like. I do not depend on anyone or anything for my life. I have life in myself. That's what's being communicated in that picture. And now here in John's gospel, we're saying, see, Jesus is God with us. So what is true of God is true of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he also has life in himself. And that, of course, is why when you come to the story of the cross, the Lord Jesus tells us this in John chapter 10, just a little later on here. He says, no one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. So you see, when Jesus hung on the cross and suffered there as the sacrifice for our sins, he could have at any moment released himself from the cross by his own divine power. And he didn't do that. Why? Because he gave himself as the sacrifice for our sins. He laid down his own life. He has the power to lay it down, and he had the power to take it up again on the third day when he rose from the dead. Why? Because life is in him. He has life in itself, in himself. Now, here's this marvelous truth about Jesus. Life is in him. Now, here's the question. How does the life that's in him get into us? And the Bible is very, very clear in the answer to that question. Life is is in Jesus, if Jesus is in us, life will be in us. And that's the teaching of Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 that many of you will know well. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Life is in Jesus. When I come to him in faith, Jesus is in me. 
And when Jesus is in me, the life that is in Jesus is also in me. Now let's go back then to the picture of Jesus knocking on the door of your life. Suppose the person in the house feels that you have life already. You know what? I'm quite content. I have all that I need in this house. Here's this person knocking on the door. The person knocking on the door doesn't have anything that I need or anything that I want. Why should I ever open the door? I mean, perhaps that person will turn out to be a thief anyway. Well, if you think you have everything that you need in the house and the one who knocks on the door has nothing to offer you, you'll certainly not open the door. But do you see that Jesus is telling us here that precisely the opposite is the case? Here you are, the person inside the house. The person in the house does not have life. Does not have life. The one who has life in himself is the one who's outside and knocking on the door. And he's no thief. He's come for this reason that the person inside the house will have life. And he says, have it more abundantly. And when you come to see that Jesus has life in himself, and the reason that he has come is in order to give the life that he has to you, well, then when you come to see it, if you believe it, you will get up and you will gladly and freely open the door. Now, here then is a question that you can ask and a picture that you can paint. Thirdly, a promise that you can make. Uh, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, Jesus says. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, here in the last section, I want just to speak directly to everyone who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, which I'm sure is the vast majority of us here in this third service. Jesus came so that you could have life. And if you are in Christ, you have it. Life is in Christ, and if Christ is in you, then life is in you. But I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, I've come that you may have life, period. He says in these four wonderful words, and have it abundantly. And have it abundantly. That's what he says to you. Now, what do these words mean? It would be very easy, of course, for us to say, well, now Jesus wants you to have a life of total fulfillment, health and wealth and satisfaction in your job and in your marriage and for you to have everything that you want just when you want it and so forth and so on. And of course, that would be a complete misunderstanding of this verse. We all know that believers get sick, that believers experience loss, that we know as believers what it is to live with sometimes deep, deep disappointment, hurt, and pain. Most of all, Jesus tells us that if we are going to follow him, what we're going to have to do is deny ourselves, take up our cross every day in order to follow him. So what does Jesus mean when he says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly? Here's what it means. Jesus has more to give than any of us has yet received. That's a wonderful truth. The Lord Jesus Christ has more to give than any of us has yet received. And what does a more abundant life look like? Let me give you seven answers. They're going to be very quick. Seven ways in which we should seek more from our Lord Jesus Christ. First, more peace. 
Jesus came to give us peace. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Jesus can give more peace than any of us have yet received. And some of us have come here today and you're really troubled. You can come and you can ask of him to increase your peace. He's got more peace to give you than you have yet received. Second, more love. Who can measure the breadth or length or depth or height of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ? Greater love has no one than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus Christ has more love to pour into your needy heart than you have yet known or experienced. And you can come and you can ask and receive more of his love according to your need as you move forward in your Christian life. Third, more joy. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus can give more joy than any of us here has yet felt. Fourth, more faith. Here you are struggling with particular challenges, and Jesus can increase your faith to match the challenge that you face. In the Bible, we read about little faith. We read about great faith, growing faith, strong faith. Jesus is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. What that means is Jesus is the one who brings our faith into being, and Jesus is the one who brings our faith into maturity. That means that He can give you more faith than you have had. He can give more faith than any of us have yet received. Fifth, more repentance. What a wonderful gift this is. It is the means by which we become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of God that we receive through Jesus is what teaches us to say no to, unworldly, to worldly passions and yes to an upright and self-controlled and godly life. And Jesus can give a deeper repentance than any of us has yet discovered. Sixthly, more strength. Jesus can give you more strength than you are experiencing or, or feeling right now, and that's what will enable you to move forward in the challenges that you face in the coming days. There was a time when the Apostle Paul in his life began to feel completely exhausted. He had been carrying a burden, and he came to the conclusion he could carry it no longer. And at that moment, the Lord Jesus Christ said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, my power, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Jesus can give more strength than any of us has yet enjoyed. And seventhly and lastly, more hope. But this I call to mind, we read in Scripture, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Here's how you can have the hope that you need. With every day that opens up to you, the mercies of God are going to be sufficient to get you through. You see, the life that Jesus gives, and there's more of it that He has to give than any of us have yet received, that's what makes it possible for you to face life in this world with all of its difficulties, all of its challenges, all of its thieves, all of its pains, all of its disappointments. And if you have suffered loss, these words of Jesus are especially for you. The thief has come to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Friends, don't be satisfied with a small measure of what Jesus can give. A little bit of faith, a little bit of peace, a little bit of joy. When this Savior has more to give, than any of us have yet received. So why would we not then take seriously his words when he says to us, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. 
Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Jesus Christ is able to give you all that you need for all that you face in every season and circumstance of your life. A question you can ask, a picture you can paint, and a promise you can make. Let me just in this last moment come back to that picture of Jesus knocking at the door. And to the person who even this morning is unsure about whether you should get up and, and open the door of your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I, I just want to say to you in closing, you know, the person who's knocking on the door of your life really knows you. Uh, he knows the thieves who've taken from you. And he knows the extent of what has been taken. You will find, even if you think right now that Jesus seems like a stranger on the outside, if you will invite him in, you will soon feel completely at home with him because he knows your whole story from beginning until right now, and he knows your future story as well. And the person who's knocking on your door not only knows you, but he loves you. He really does. He gave himself for you. He came into the world so that you should have life abundantly, and he has more to give than you will ever be able to receive in the whole of your life. And even to all eternity, you'll go on receiving more and more and more and more from Jesus Christ. The person who is knocking on your door is not a thief. And when you see who it is that knocks on the door of your life, and when you see what it is that he can give to you, well, then very freely and very gladly, you're going to get up and open the door and welcome him in. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful today that the Son of God did not come into the world to steal or kill or destroy. Thank you that he came to give us life and to give it more abundantly. And we ask, Father, therefore, that we may never be satisfied with only a small measure of what you are able to give, but that the pattern of our life by faith may be to draw near to you and to seek from you what you hold in your hands, that we may experience the good of more and more of it. And for those who we know and love who have wandered away and really think that you would be like a thief who would make their life less. Father, we pray that they would come to see how little is on the inside of the house and how much the Savior who knocks on the door holds in his hands and is ready to give to all who will open the door and welcome him in. Hear our prayers and may there be many who opened the door to the Savior over this Christmas period. For these things we ask in Jesus' wonderful name.